Well? Good morning. Good morning. Hi, I'm on you. Hey, Manchu. Hello, Amanda. Hi, Amanda. All right. There we go. <laughs> <coughs> Ready to go, I guess. Uh, a few more people will be joining us pretty soon. So, how is everyone today? Yeah, hi there. Still waking up. <laughs> All right. So, we want to get started with uh, updates for the week. I know some of you are giving updates for the GSOC, but... Hello, Jesse. All right. Uh, we're good. Uh, so this week we've had uh, some pretty interesting conversations with respect to sort of the fall term. And uh, we've been working on kind of a plan forward for some of the interns and some of the research and some of the things that we want to do more generally. So I've, uh, I've met with Jesse and I met with a couple other people to kind of get that going and thinking about what we want to do. So, uh, you know, there are things like we want to bring in a new crop of interns. We want to have like you know, uh, keep doing our outreach. Uh, we want to follow up on the GSOC project. The GSOC project's ending, like, you know, the GSOC projects are ending next month, early next month. But then, you know, people are welcome to work on them and spin off uh, the research from that. And in fact, it's encouraged because it's open source software and we want to be able to get people to use it and, and other things. So, uh, you know, that'll be there. And then we'll have our Neuromatch uh, submissions in September and our presentations at the end of that month. And then we have this open house that we want to do uh, coming up. Uh, we don't know when yet, probably by the end of the year. And then on top of all of that, we have our other things that we're doing and submitting. So that's, that's very, very active. Uh, so that's my update. Uh, wants to go next <laughs> okay morgan yeah no, not not much to update <clears throat> but um and yeah i see a lot of cars around san francisco trucks getting ready for burning man oh, okay yeah <laughs> <That's great. clears throat> have you ever been no 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 okay <laughs> no. I, I, um, I know or i i think um I think Adam Ghazali has, who's the, okay, the yeah. last guy at UCSF. Um, uh, I think he's. I think he's been. Maybe some lab members have been. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I, I see, um, like bl black rock rangers on on a um, like an SUV in my neighborhood. <laughs> I think they they provide support for people. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, and, uh, and certainly online, I see people getting our projects ready. And yeah. Things. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I'm sure there'll be a big contingent. And uh, everybody just got back from, or, you know, there was there was a big crew that had headed to DEF CON for, uh, down in Las Vegas at, um, at Noise Bridge. So okay. it, it, it is August. So I think a lot of people are, you know, doing, doing, you know, these are holidays for people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and and like I said, there's the um, DevConf uh, US uh, is going on right now. I think in Boston, um, but but it's obviously just online. Yeah. And this is a big Linux conference that um, that I certainly knew from. Um, like, uh, is it Czech Republic or Slovakia? I see DevConf CZ is the one that I know, which is, I think, in January. <clears throat> so I'd, I said that um, they had some they had some uh, um, some sessions that seemed kind of related to the GSOC um, open communities uh, project. Yeah. And um, um, and other than that, yeah, there's 
you know, some really good things I've, I've posted in computational psychiatry, um, along with, um, and, and organoids. Um, I love the, uh, I love the, uh, the, the little mini, mini brain EEG for, for round cerebral organoids. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Johns Hopkins. Um, so, uh, uh, try and dig in through the, you know, that's, uh, more of a popular science article, but, uh, right. but it, it's to some, some, some research and some, uh, s certainly some good proposals for, you know, how we need to do the recordings from the organoids differently. That, uh, that's really interesting following along the kind of work that Alison Wutry and, uh, and Bradley Wojtek have, have previously done on electrophysiology of the, of the cerebral organoids which is, you know, that's definitely my, my main interest. Um, and, um, yeah, and check there's, there's some other interesting things in, in, uh, in Slack channels, but, um, uh, I'm mostly working on the upcoming hackathon at, um, NerdTech X global hackathon. So yeah, please check that out. I'll, I'll post a link for the, the hackathon itself. Yeah. Maybe we'll go over that a little bit mm -hmm. later on. Yeah, and, and, and like I said to Jesse, uh, love to hear more about, you know, we robot and, you know, how much VR and neurotech would be be relevant for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah that'd be great. Uh, thank you. That's good. Good update. Uh, Jesse, did you have an update? Or Amanda, actually? Yeah, I can go ahead. Um... I don't really have an update because I've basically been camping since our last meeting. Um, I haven't even had a chance to catch up on messages in the Slack, um, but it was a great trip. Oh, good. Where'd you go? Um, the Porcupine Mountains in the oh, Upper okay. Peninsula yeah. of Michigan. Yeah. <laughs> great. Yeah, no, no soul service. Pretty, pretty I know. Remote. Yeah. <laughs> well, great. Thanks. Yeah. Good. Glad you enjoyed it. Uh, Jesse, did you want to go? How about Hamanshu? Did you want to give an update or? All right, maybe later we can do that. Oh, okay, can't open your mic. All right, yeah, okay, go ahead and type. <laughs> open up the window here. I'll be able to say more in about five minutes. Okay. So, yeah, I yeah, can, we'll do that. Yeah, just a, a little bit more and I can like speak freely, so just okay. Like, All right. Uh, so yeah, while we're waiting, I can show something that happened this week. This involved uh, Samantha Carollo. She's uh, one of our interns and she comes to the meetings regularly. Uh, she put a blog post up and so this is our, our media blog and this is her blog on the empathy of artificial intelligence, which is about like incorporating empathy into AI and how it's actually necessary to have a more human-like intelligence. So this kind of walks through, this is one of her research topics that she's interested in. She walked through the, you know, she gave a couple paragraphs on sort of the introduction to intelligence uh, and then, you know, how important empathetic intelligence is and uh, then going into some of the things about why it's important, the kinds of things that it would be used for in an AI and then how hard it is to actually put that into the AI. And then how critical it is to have uh, as part of the AI that, it, you know, you can't have like a rational agent without sort of empathy and, and emotion modeled into it. And so there are a lot of medical applications, for example, where it's very important to have an empathetic AI because the AI has to be able to relate to the patients and uh, other things like that. 
So that's a nice uh, sort of, actually, she takes an angle of uh, uh, job automation and then arrows it down to like med the medical field. So this is this is a nice piece of, uh, you know, this is a nice piece for a blog because it's very simple. You walk through a problem, you kind of define some of the things of interest, and then you get into some of the other details of it and give an example. And so you've got references here. Uh, so, you know, this is the way you would do a blog post. Actually, she gave me the raw blog post, which is the text, and I did some editing of the text and put these images in. And, you know, that's the way we'll do that. So if you want to write a blog post, you know, it's definitely worth uh, just kind of not worrying about whether it's perfect. Just, you know, send a nice, argued, reasoned uh, piece of text, you know, maybe about 900 to 1,000 words. And then we can edit it uh, as we need to, put some references in to support your argument. And then, you know, that's, and then we'll post it. And so it'll, you know, it should gain a lot of, traction you know these are the sorts of things that build off of one another so when you have something that is you know a very short piece like that it's very succinct you can maybe write a larger paper and i think she's written some larger work on that in her uh school work but you know this might be something she could publish or in a longer form or you know foster conversation i've had a lot of conversations built from blog posts so uh, yeah it does do it does help I just, just wanted to say that um, that MathWorks has a, an interesting job. Uh, uh, um, I mean, it's a part-time job as a data storyteller. Okay. And uh, it it looks like a, like a you know it's like a blog post like write blog posts plus plus some code uh, you know de like describing some code and um, and we'll pay you. I think it like it's, it's strangely it's like three 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 thousand three hundred and thirty three dollars. <laughs> not, not sure why I chose that, but um, but I, I'll find the. Um, I think I think again I, I typically post like these kind of job things on um, Nerdtech X's Slack because they've right. got a jobs uh, uh, site. Yeah. But um, yeah. But. Well, that's good. Some yeah. People here might have some code that they want to talk about too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And if we want to, like, we can also do that in a blog post where you can walk through code, just give the, like, piece of code. And, I mean, you know, the way to do that is not to dump a bunch of code and just say, look at it for yourself. <laughs> you have to walk through it a little bit, like, annotate it. So I would take, like, maybe six lines of code and talk about what it does and why it's important to my problem. So, you know, that's that's the way you would do that. I wouldn't, you know, put the whole, I mean, you could put a link to the code on GitHub, but yeah, just that's they, about they, it. They're definitely emphasizing the storyteller. Yeah, part. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so that's that's uh, the sort of the way to do that. If you're interested, I know that Amanda and Brian want to do blog posts. So, And, you know, they can be longer, too. It doesn't have to be really short, but... It can be, you know, the one of the things I've noticed, though, is that if it gets too long, it might be better to break it up into parts because it's, you know, people read, have a finite amount of time. And on the uh, medium, they actually time out the stories. Like, they say, it's uh, this is a five-minute read. So <laughs> I've never seen anything longer than, like, seven or eight minutes. And I don't know, maybe that's just because that's as high as it goes. <laughs> like... <laughs> If you put like 30,000 words in there, I wonder what it would say, but I don't know. I've seen some long ones. One more, one last thing about blog posting. Um, I know it, 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 the caveat is that it is kind of a niche thing, but it's still part of like AI and computer science that, that this community came about. Um, well, not community. I, I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe it's not that niche, really. Maybe, maybe I should just take away my caveat and say, the thing about blog posts is that um, a lot of really good people who are kind of pissed off with the publishing process in general and just want to talk about stuff and not really write full papers and go through the review process, 
have significantly committed to just writing blog posts. Like they don't, they don't, they literally don't care anymore. And it's like, I want to write this. I have great discussions. I have, I have talked with high level academic people and very high quality professional like blog articles. And some of it's not even the highest quality, but like, like, they, like people, they, there's kind of a, I, I think, I think there's sort of like, well, it's wise to kind of differentiate between like, oh, I'm going to write a post on Medium or I'm going to, I'm going to have a little like blogspot.com post and kind of just to get it out there in the way that we talk about deliverables. Like, yeah, that's, that's absolutely a valid thing, a real thing and a good thing. But also just like, I think it's important. And, and I know we, we all know, like, we all know experts in the field who have blogs, you know, too. But I think it's important to stress that. Um, I'm not saying base your career around writing blog posts, but at the same time, I literally have had conversations with people who are, who've said, I'm not really interested in writing papers anymore. I have more immediate feedback and response and contributing things that I get cited when I write blog posts. And so I, I just want to, I just want to really emphasize that blog. I don't know. Maybe it's, maybe it's because I grew up in a time where blog posts was like, oh, you have your, you know, your live journal or MySpace and like you have your blog about your ideas and your thoughts. But like, like there's like people who are in very, very serious academic work being done in blogs these days. Mm. And I think it's important to kind of say, you know, don't, don't take blogs lightly in the long, in, in the bigger picture, because there's kind of this link to <laughs> people being fed up with the publication and review and, and other system too. So I'll leave it at that. It, it was, <clears throat> it was interesting hearing um, DeGrasse Tyson and Duncan was talking recently on, on, I, I guess on Star Talk or, um, and, <clears throat> but the, the, they were talking about kind of public outreach and things and and you know DeGrasse Tyson was saying that like he likes Twitter because he gets because of the feedback yeah. like he, he writes better mm -hmm. after after tweeting something seeing the feedback <clears throat> and getting a better sense of how to approach a topic and you know like I, I, the, their discussion is really really interesting um, um, yeah uh, just about this, about kind of like the writing and about uh, how to how to craft your arguments over time. Like the, this is a better feedback loop than than publishing and and that feedback loop. Yeah, the, there have been a lot of mathematicians who have tried to do a collaborative work by a blog. Like they'll put something up and then they'll get comments and then and this has been like this is something that they've been doing since like the mid two thousands. So. It's not something brand new, <laughs> but like, you know, that's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's like preprints. They've used <clears throat> preprints in physics for many, many years, so it's not, not necessarily a new thing, but, but no, I, I get, you know, if you're interested in writing a blog post, like this is our sort of artifact structure, you know, we start small and then we build up to a bigger thing. So, uh, Himanshu put an update in the chat. Thank you, Himanshu. Um, I researched a bit on non-stationarity in environments for like uh, agents and things like that. So, Himanshu is working on some of these uh, like virtual environments for agents. So, you know, in AI research, they have these environments where they can train agents that are richer than say, like just feeding it data from like a, a database of pictures. Uh, so non-stationarity in environments and completed a net logo tutorial. That's good. Um, and I will be creating the agent based model in net logo, but in Python by using the extension shared by Morgan. So Morgan, uh, shared a, a Python extension of net logo, uh, several weeks ago and people in the GSOC group have been working with that. And it's, uh, you know, NetLogo is this agent-based modeling software and has a lot of stock models. But the problem is, is that the, the language it's written in is not Python. It's <laughs> like a mix of C and I, I don't know what else, like other things that are not as, it may be a little bit more obscure to people uh, trying to modify the models. So that's good that we have the Python extension. So that's, 
And so that's, that's you know, coming along uh, a lot of that agent-based work. Um, now, non-stationarity, uh, so that is an interesting topic uh, or a concept. So how many people know what that is? I mean, Himanchi knows what it is probably, but... Okay, so non-stationarity is when you have like a time series or a signal and there's like a non-stationarity to it. So it's not like a, a sine wave where you have like this constant uh, frequency, but that the frequency varies across the... Uh, that's the best way I can explain it. I hope I'm explaining it right because it's been a while since I've looked up a definition of it. But uh, it, it's, you know, it's important because you have a lot of things in the world that are non-stationary, uh, you know, a lot of processes that, you know, if you measure it, you're measuring multiple things uh, at once or there are things that with different periods to them. So, you know, if I asked you how awake you are and I had a way of measuring awakeness, uh, that would fluctuate. It wouldn't be like constant. I mean, it, you know, you'd have like, uh, uh, like a circadian rhythm that you have and then you'd have like your arousal which varies by, you know, uh, minute by minute. But then you also have other things that influence that. So it's a very non-stationary signal. Um, so that's that's an important concept in environments because environments do that. They have a lot of components. They're, you know, they have like a stochastic component, which means it's kind of random. But they also have a deterministic component, which is like where the sun, you know, rises and sets at certain times in a, in a location on Earth you know, where you can actually measure it uh, as, you know, you can, like, say, at the, at this time, uh, this date, the sun will rise at this time, set at this time. So that's not, you know, that's deterministic. Stochastic would be if it just occurred differently every day and you wouldn't know necessarily when it would rise or set. So that's, and then you have mixtures of those in, in the environment too. So that's why it's important to get that. And it's, you know, maybe not something we think about when we think about measurement techniques, um, especially for like cognition, but, um, you know, it's there. <laughs> and I know Morgan, because he works on EEG, probably knows a bit about this. Yeah, yeah. I, and I was I was actually trying to think of how, how I came across that Pi Net logo. And I, I think it was from um, SA Lib, so which is sensitivity analysis. So you're really looking at kind of... Um, <clears throat> How, how appropriate is say your your Fourier analysis? Yeah, <laughs> and 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 if you so if if you were really dealing with like non stationary data, um, oh, and how much has got more? You yeah, know, um, uh, yeah. Th this this would be this would be a nice way to um, tell whether you know how how appropriate is your model, right? right? <clears throat> right. And and I think I think this came out of. If you remember um, pirates, oh right, right. Um, P Y R A T E S, um, uh, uh, which has a it is from from Leipzig and um, I'm, I'm blanking on the PI's name, but but I've known him forever. Uh, um, I'm getting old, um, it, but uh, it's a great great package that implements multiple computational neuroscience models, and and but also the tools to kind of look at their appropriateness in terms of <clears throat> you know, uh, not just how well do they fit the fit the data but also when you start looking at the residuals you know what kind of structure is left and things like that <clears throat> yeah and then amanshu has got more here yeah so non-stationarity and multi-agents stems from breaking the mdp assumption in single agent algorithms uh, mdp being can't remember. Uh, decision process. Oh yeah, yeah. Markov decision process assumption. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so basically, transition functions and reward as feedback mechanism depends on action of all agents present in the environment. Uh, so this this is like where the we have the, the Markov model with the different states and we have the transitions between the states, but then that's you know we have that we have the hidden Markov model. And then we have something where, depending on the state of the environment, your your agents, your context, the Markov model is going to, to be different, maybe. Uh, and then, of course, the rewards as well, because your rewards are going to change with 
what states are available to you and, and so forth. Uh, and then, so, you know, you're doing this action and things are changing. I think we talked about this in yesterday's meeting in, in the GSOC meeting where, you know, the way we measure cognition is that we, you know, a lot of times we'll do like these single experiments and then we'll randomize them and say, well, if you get a random sample of people responding to something, then you just, you know, that's a good way because it's objective to measure it that way. But actually, maybe a better way is this naturalistic uh, approach where you just put the agent in a world, you let it behave, and then you basically account for like changes in the environment that are dynamic and that are fluid with respect to the agent. So the agent is moving through the world, everything's changing, and the agent's sort of the internal model of the agent is changing with it. Uh, the world model is changing with it. So the world, the state of the world, there are new variables popping up as you encounter them and, and so forth. Um, so then all agents present in the environment whose policy is constantly changing in the learning process. So as the learning process proceeds, the objective changes, and which is good because if you think about when you learn things, you learn, you have an objective when you start, but then that objective becomes outdated as you'll know more. You say, well, that doesn't make any sense to learn anymore. Throw that out. Um, but, you know, it's easier to do like a single objective and then just work towards that objective, obviously. So that's why a lot of people have done that. There is a case when, where the agent can enter an endless cycle of adapting to other agents uh, and stuck in a loop, basically. So, yeah, and you, you have that problem in a lot of algorithms, but this is, yeah, one example of where you can have that problem. Uh, yeah, and that, that's, I mean, that's maybe that's how cognition works. But it, from, a, <laughs> from a modeling standpoint, it's not great because we can't evaluate it <laughs> easily. Um, part of the reason you want to build a model is because you want to evaluate it instead of just saying, behold, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, so, and then Morgan put a link in to read the docs. I don't, uh, so this is a, a sensitivity analysis library in Python. So this is something that uh, might be interesting. It's, it's a statistics uh, Again, one of the one of the nice one of the nice dependencies from from pirates. Okay, yeah. Uh, so welcome, Samantha. Congratulations on your blog post. Hi, good morning. Thank Hi. you. Um, sorry, I joined late. I got stuck on a, a work call, so I had to oh, hop no on problem. that this yeah. morning. Um, do you want me to give an update besides the the blog post and everything? Yeah, that'd be good. Um, so this week, besides the blog post, which I'm very grateful for you um, editing and putting up there for me, Bradley, so thank you. Yeah. Um, I've been getting back into school this week because I start class on Monday. Um, so getting back into the swing of things has been hard. It's been a real like reset because I felt like I just left. But other than that, there hasn't been much other stuff. Like I said in the in my update this week, I'm taking a 22 credit semester this semester. Yeah. So I don't know if I'm ready for that or not. Yeah. <laughs> so but other than that, that's pretty much my update. So well, good luck with the 22 credits. That's going to be pretty <laughs> yeah. intense. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, that's a, a nice update. Um, yeah, we went over the blog post a little bit earlier, and I think people were pretty impressed. And uh, that's that's a good template for a blog post, um, just the way you approach it. You know, you go through, do a general introduction, you go into a sort of a domain of example domain, and then you get into a problem, and and then you wrap it up. And it's like, uh, but, you know, not, that's not the only way you can do it. You can do it other ways. Uh, you know, Brian's doing a post uh, on some things, and... You know, when, when I get the, when I do the editing, I, I usually want to make it like a little bit clearer and, and put some images in because those are important for blog posts and things like that. But that's, yeah. So, I mean, don't worry about if it's like at a high level of polish, we'll, we'll take care of that. It's like, um, yeah, this is uh, Morgan posted something, IEEE, oh, reinforcement learning and non-stationary discrete. Yeah. I mean, just, just uh, yeah, you know, mean field approaches for this non-stationary problem. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, 
Yeah, so thank you for that update, Samantha. Uh, and Himanshu, thank you. Uh, Jesse, did you want to give an update? Are you uh, are ready to talk? <laughs> no, I'm going to defer to Brian first. I'll go oh, yeah, before. Brian. Yeah. Okay, let's Brian update. Sure. Um, I'm still plugging away at GSAC and, and a blog post. Um, but I did watch a really fantastic um, video by Brian Cantwell Smith last night about computation um, that lines up with the uh, intuitionistic type theory and all that stuff I've been blathering about. So I'll share that on the Slack. I haven't yet. All right. Um, but yeah, not much, not much to say right now, um, or not much to show, I should say. I'm still kind of working through, um, similar to Hamachu, this these really subtle details of things like Markov decision processes and other Asian-based modeling caveats. Um, so this is non-stationarity is actually super interesting to, to know about. This is exactly what I'm dealing with in my network project right now. So this is good. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um... So yeah, that's great. Uh, so good, good thing that we're kind of synergizing here and everything. So uh, why don't I go into some other things here? I wanted to actually, uh, yeah. So Jesse can give us update later. We can go into uh, something else here. Um, I do want to talk about some of the Slack things later, but um, I, I found something. Uh, we've talked about vision papers before, and I wanted to talk a little bit about. Well, actually. Before I get to that, I wanted to talk about another paper. But so I, I reviewed this paper uh, in that was slated for Frontiers in Psychology, and it was on neurobotics. And uh, the author Eric Leonidas is on Twitter, and he uh, tweeted it out yesterday. And Jesse was like, "Oh, this is yeah. really interesting." So uh, and there's a whole there's a whole like a special issue around exactly what we're doing, which is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. So it, 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 in the, I think the issue is on measurement techniques, or is it something? Or it's neurobotics. Uh, oh, robotic and bionic systems as tools of study cognition. There is paradigms and methodological yeah. issues. So this is like methods, but it's like in this area of uh, robots and bionic systems. Okay, uh, to study cognition. So what they mean by bionic systems are biological systems. Like you know, in this case, they're doing something with with. Uh, they, they've come up with this model. It's like a, a robot that's like a rat or the rats that interact with robots, actually. So there's this interaction between these robots and these rats and their social interactions and their other things. And it's, it's a, it, what they call interactive neurorobotics. So this is the title, Interactive Neurorobotics, Behavior and Neural Dynamics of Agent Interactions. It's in Frontiers in Psychology. It just came out a couple days ago. I reviewed it. Uh, uh, was one of the reviewers on it, and it was pretty interesting. A lot of the things they've published a couple other papers on methods for looking at dynamical systems, which is another nice uh, aspect of this paper. It kind of work, builds on that work, and um, so you know they're they're doing dynamical systems as well in this paper. So uh, the abstract reads. Interactive neurobotics, a subfield which characterizes brain responses evoked during interaction with a robot and their relationship with the behavioral responses. Gathering rich neural and behavioral data from humans or animals responding to agents act as a scaffold for the design process of future social robots. So they're interested in social robots and how robots can interact with you know, the world and with other robots or other conspecifics. In this case, they're recording from the brain of a, a, a rat and the rat is interacting with a rat-like robot. And then they're getting that data and they're kind of making an inference to how you would design a future robot. Um, this research seeks to study how organisms respond to artificial agents in contrast to biological or in inanimate ones. And so this is another thing where it's, it's kind of a second layer where you have uh, this, this response to something that's either like a virtual object or a robot, which is like kind of virtual in its nature because it doesn't exhibit all the characteristics of a human. So there's this concept um, called the uncanny valley. And I don't know who's heard of the uncanny valley, 
Yeah, I know people were recognizing mm -hmm. this. It's big, big in movies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I forget, I forget the movie that kind of was a big fail because of its uncanny. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, avatars. Cats. Yeah. Cats, right? Was that cats? Cats, I believe. Oh, the new cats. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Which I had recommend watching actually. It's it's really good. But yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's. And that's an issue that you have, you know, you have robots. You have to make the robots look real to the rat and, or, you know, the mouse, uh, the rodent, I guess. Um, and then, uh, you know, you want to make sure that it does, it recognizes it as, as a conspecific or else it doesn't really work well. So there are a lot of things you have to consider in terms of the experimental setup. But they do use this sort of uh, naturalistic approach here. Which is nice because it's it you know it isn't that assumption that we just kind of respond or don't respond to something. But there's this this longer set of interactions that happens. Uh, this but, experiment was that. Well, I was just going to say that this this uh, reminds me um, Adam Calhoun, who I, I believe is like a neuroethologist. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, like I, I don't know how best to describe his work, but. Um, uh amazing work right and uh but he posted a, a a link to a video of a a robot crab i think interacting with real crabs yeah and and i was trying to find it so i've posted this link of a of a northwestern press release but it's not the one so i um yeah if uh it, it's always worth going through adam calhoun's twitter feed anyway yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so but but uh, uh, but th this you know very much reminds me of uh, uh, something he posted. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this experiment uses the novel affordance as a robotic platform to investigate complex dynamics during minimally structured interactions that would be difficult to capture with classical experimental setups. So this is a general framework for making these naturalistic interactions happen combined with multimodal observations and complementary analysis pipelines that are necessary to render a holistic picture of the data for the purpose of informing robotic design principles. Finally, we demonstrate this approach with an exemplar rat robot social interaction task, which includes simultaneous multi-agent tracking and neural recordings. So they have this, they track the agent, uh, you know, they do motion tracking. So like the uh, rat runs around its environment it gets close to the robot, you know, they, there are all these interactions that you can look at from that perspective. And then you can also record what's going on in the brain. So it's very important to know like kind of the, the proxim, proximal nature of like the, the rat, the agent, and you know, how it's moving around its environment. Also, it's also important to know what the, the neural response is. And you can, you know, and this is a sort of a framework for this, so you can modify this any way you want. Uh, so the, the introduction kind of goes into some of these things. Uh, so interactive robotics that uses robotics to experiment on way probe questions in behavioral ethology, neuroscience, and psychology. These these different types of animal assays, and these are some of the readings. So they talk about robot frogs that can emit auditory calls. Uh, they can mean set up in habitats and elicit fighting and even mating responses from wild frogs. So you can have robot frogs that sort of act as a, they mimic some of the features of frogs, like auditory calls, and that's a very big thing in frogs. And it can, they can basically simulate different, you know, basically something that can elicit different responses from the real frogs. So this is, you know, this is the uncanny valley, but it's thinking about it in a different way. It's thinking about it in terms of like frog calls and if the frog recognizes it as like a uh, genuine frog call, and we don't really know that for sure, but one of the things we can know is that like they respond in a way similar to what if a real frog were calling. Uh, the second example is robot fish that interact with living schools of fish and vibrating robots that attract bees have shown effects on collective behavior in laboratory naturalistic environments. So again, you have these cues that these robots will give off and the animals are interpreting them as something that they can interact with. And so this is the benefit of this sort of, uh, you know, naturalistic approach is that you put it in a naturalistic environment. 
you provide cues that give just enough resolution and you can actually mimic, you know, in a way that the animal recognizes these type of things. And then they have robot rats, uh, which are these different types of rats, the eye rat and the Waseda rat from Waseda University in Japan, interacting with living rats and affecting their behavior in laboratory settings. So the Waseda rat was used specifically to manipulate stress and anxiety-like behaviors, whereas the eye rat was used to induce social interaction dynamics. So there are a lot of ways you can do this. Um, so this is an image of the robot rat. It's sort of a, like looks like a little eye robot or a Roomba, but it's, uh, uh, you know, the rat recognizes it maybe as something to interact with. Um, you know, so it doesn't, it's not dressed up as a rat. It just has like the same body shape and it does some of the similar behaviors and the rat interacts with it. Um, let me see if I can get back here. Oh, I guess it just popped out. Okay. Uh, so that's, that's what it looks like. Uh, and then this is a diagram where they put electrode placement in the olfactory bulb, in the hippocampus, in the medial amygdala. And these are all areas that are important for like rats like to smell, sniff things. They use their uh, olfactory sense for a lot of things like dogs do. Uh, so they have a big olfactory bulb. Then they have the hippocampus, which is used in memory and in spatial navigation. Then they have the medial amygdala, which is used in emotional processing. And all those things are going to be, um, you know, give a response when they interact with this, con this robotic conspecific. So they can put in electrodes measure the activity for different interactions. And, uh, you know, they have to have this time series because it's a naturalistic experiment. So if you, you can segment these time series out, so you can find like specific windows and, and figure out what's going on at a specific time. And you can synchronize it with like motion tracking or video. And it's nice, it's a nice system if you can get it to work well together. Um, but, you know, this sort of thing is, like where you have the, the, you can treat it as like a time series. You can treat it as a dynamical system. You can also take windows of the data and map it to specific events in the, in the video or in the motion tracking. And you can have like a statement about like every time the rat backs off from the, from its conspecific, what are these signals? What do these signals look like? And you can isolate those uh, individual things in the video or in the, in the motion tracking and you can average over those and you can get it like an answer and you can say, this is the amount of activity and there's a lot of processing that goes on with this time series, but this is the amount of average amount of activity when this event happens. So there are a lot of ways you can analyze it. Uh, then, you know, you have these different behaviors that rats do. Uh, so there are these stereotypical behaviors, uh, rearing, immobility, and grooming. And these are all things you can characterize easily uh, you know, that you have some coder usually can identify in video where you can identify by some characteristic trace in the movement uh, of the animal, but they, they, they occur on a regular basis. So these are behaviors that we know rats do. And so you kind of hook your uh, neural recordings on these different behavioral responses. So you can identify them as discrete events. Um, so this is uh, the, the position tracking. So you can see the robot and animal moving around. You can track their movement and you can see that it's like a, you know, they move all around the environment. It's not just like, you know, points, dots. They're, they're actually trajectories. So that helps actually because it gives you that full range of data. You can average out some of these trajectories or you can just look at it as a dynamical system. It's, you know, flexible when you look at it from that level. Um, and then, you know, they kind of go through some data here. Uh, I wanted to get to maybe some of the dynamical system stuff. I'm not seeing it right now. Um, but, you know, they do a lot of analysis of the data. Um, there is some, I know there's some uh, dynamical system stuff in here. But a lot of the stuff with these time series with these signals, those are all very amenable to dynamical systems analysis. And, of course, you know, when you have... Uh, there, there are other methods that they use for looking at dynamical systems and some of these things. So this is stuff that's, you know, um, definitely something we should look into a little bit more in terms of the specific methods and how they compare 
So, um, and so this is actually an interesting part here. Comparing the neurobehavioral states evoked by conspecifics, robots, and objects may clue us into some of the minimal requirements for an animal to perceive artificial agents as social others. A key insight from Deteri 2020 about the philosophical foundations of the field is that interactive robotics experiments by themselves do not necessarily tell us about the or how organisms interact with conspecifics or predators and suggest we should examine these interactions in their own terms before drawing unwarranted conclusions from the observations. These do not preclude a comparative, a comparative approach. It just requires we first take the robot case on its own terms and then compare it with data from social object and predator interactions. So this is a nice uh, sort of a philosophy of science point, I guess, is that you have this, you know, how do you measure this stuff and how do you know that like the ro robot real analogy works? I mean, we get, get data and it makes sense, but like, how do we know what we're looking at is in that, is it in that uncanny valley or is it like, do they view that as a real conspecific? And that's a problem you see in, in experiments a lot with ecological validity, something they call ecological validity, which is your set, your experimental setup, how valid is it, the, the sort of the nature of the task or the nature of the thing that you're doing, the interaction or whatever it is. How realistic is that? If it's not realistic, you can get a nice result, but it doesn't really mean a lot. It won't generalize that they're things. It's just like this thing that you get, and it's almost artifactual. If it, but most experiments are somewhat ecologically valid, so that's not really a problem. But you know that a lot of these like uh, sort of naturalistic experiments, and especially when you do things like with robots or video games or virtual environments, you know you have to be careful to say. You know, this is this is uh, actually they're they're picking up on something they would pick up on in the real world if we were to give them, like put them in an ecosystem, <laughs> or like with the frogs, if they had other frogs around making calls, are we replicating the calls enough enough of the information in the calls to uh, really kind of replicate what they would get in in the real world? Um, I mean, I, I imagine like with frogs and birds that there are a lot of variation in the calls. We know that in birds, for example, they have dialects in their calls. So they're different from different locations around the ecosystem, different uh, you know, populations of birds uh, living in a certain tree or something have different dialects. So they probably use that in, in some sort of identification, but we're not really simulating all that. We're just saying, well, we can get the animal to elicit a response to it. So that's, that's what they mean by ecological validity. And, in like any VR experiment or any anything like that, it's actually quite a, an important thing to kind of <laughs> nail down. Um, and you know, this is the thing, like we have these realistic environments that we have, the immersive environments. Now, are those immersive environments really like what we would see in the real world? Or is it something else that happens to be immersive? So we have to put it in its own class of experience. Um, that we, you know, no, I don't think anyone's actually addressed that particular issue. I know that they've done a lot of things with presence, but like the idea that I think the, the, the dominant thinking has been like, if we can make virtual environments as real as possible, we can be, you know, we can basically make them like real world things. And people have used like uh, different illusions to sort of bring that point home. So if you're walking along a floor and you're looking at the floor and, and they've done this where they've simulated like a pit you know there's nothing there but they simulate like there's a there's a black pit and it's like if you walk over walk through it you'll fall and you know there's no pit of course and people are free to explore but they'll always treat that spot like it's something to avoid so it's like you know there's that aversion but is that really like re reality or is it just like something that it's a, a set of cues that we put together and say well we should avoid that area you know it's like it's like a response that you could make if it weren't really that realistic of an, of an experience. So, I mean, you know, there, I know that's a kind of a deep philosophical thing to think about on a Saturday morning, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just, I've been thinking about that for a while. It's like, you know, is this, is this, there's this virtual to real continuum. I mean, if I'm in like uh, Roblox or in um, one of these platforms where we have these like really blocky simulations, I'm obviously in a virtual world if I get to something like, 
you know, where I see things at a really high resolution. I'm obviously, you know, something almost like the real world. But, <laughs> you know, where does that boundary happen? And maybe I just treat everything like a virtual world. It's just better, <laughs> you know. The, the the real the real problem is is trying is having um you know either having a behavioral measure or having a, a, a an electrophys measure if you're say doing combined eg or something that that gives you access to that person like you know this is now this has now become real for me as opposed to you know quote sim or something yeah you know, that that i can that I can keep separate, right? and um, so we we've talked we we used to talk a lot about this because we'd have some some of the VR people in, in San Francisco joining us in Neurotech X uh, Hack Night, yeah, and um, you know whether you could use like computational psychiatry like you know games right that that would change you know would your behavior change now that you kind of are experiencing that situation as a more social thing yeah uh, it, as opposed to just the you know the the cliff thing which is kind of harder to make it you know it, it's like yeah right. you can you know you can detect the person that feels like they're falling you know but but i'm you know how useful is that or you know i'm glad that they're just doing that with adults as opposed to just babies yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like we used to just do that with babies. And I was like, you know, that's kind of cruel. Uh, but uh, um, yeah, it's like, could you use, you know, behavior in a game? Would it change once you, you know, uh, once the kind of the social reality becomes more real for you? Yeah. Um, uh, or or some or something in the in the electrophys, but uh, you know. I mean, this would be something like um, uh, Guillaume Dumas uh, might might have more to say about in terms of trying to do, trying to find hyperscanning. So doing recordings from two or more people, yeah. and then finding finding changes that are due to the the social social relations. I mean, he's he's also done like mother child, um, um, and yeah, but. Yeah. it's 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 hard it's hard to do right to, right. i mean you can kind of use you know someone's self-report in terms of you know like oh i really thought this was happening or something like that yeah. but um, uh, it'd be nice to find you know something of more of the kind of neuroethology right. or you know the computational ethology that you talked about yesterday right uh, and, and and looking up uh, uh, i didn't realize that adam calhoun now works for meta <laughs> oh yeah yeah <laughs> Um, still, still haven't found that robot video. I mean, the, the robot crab video. But uh, yeah, it's apparently he's now at Reality Labs. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, there is like actually, uh, there's something called like spatial presence and there's social presence, and they have scales, self-report scales for each of those. So you have like established things, but like in terms of measuring it as like, um, you know, sort of a continuous thing, it, like this sort of ethology or neuroethology approach i mean people try different like uh psychophysiological measures to to sort of get at that but i mean you know there there are these other questions like you know when do i think something is real when do i think it's virtual is it like is it a continuous thing or maybe sometimes you know at some points i don't treat it as real anymore or treat it as more virtual it's it's you know <laughs> if i walk around my environment and i have this simulation of my room if I walk over to the wall here and it, it's like not quite right, maybe I don't treat it as real as I do over by the door because it's just not, there's something about it that's uncanny. Uh, you know, I don't know. <laughs> so that's, that's the sort of thing, you know, that's really hard to get at. And um, yeah. And, and to, to your, to your earlier point, like even harder, if, you know, you you kind of when people are talking about empathy, you know, you kind of want that to come from, say, uh, verbal interaction, right? Or yeah. you know, like an extension of just a Turing test. Like, not only not only do I think this is a real person, but I've formed a I've formed a connection with them. Yeah. Right? 
and and again like very hard to to pin down you know a nice like mechanistic uh interpretation or you know a metric of that uh, um yeah yeah so uh yeah let me go to my other thing i was going to talk about uh if we i don't know if we had any other comments but i mean we can put them in the slack if we want okay. cool paper yeah 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 <laughs> Uh, so the other paper I wanted to talk about was, uh, let's see, this, uh, this is it. Uh, so we've talked about vision papers before, and this is Michael Nielsen, who was a, a physicist who became like working on this meta science stuff where, you know, he's interested in like note taking and his vision papers and things like that. So it's, it's kind of an interesting turn, but this is, uh, you know, very recent, like it, it's really at the heart of like research, like how we do research. So uh, I think I've talked about vision papers or, or, you know, that sort of thing before. He put a nice blog post out on some of the things, like some examples of vision papers and kind of what they look like. So I wanted to go over this a bit more. Uh, so many of the papers I most admire are vision papers, which are papers that in, instead of abstractly defining what a vision paper is, uh, we have some examples here. So vision papers are things that um, sort of lay out of a field or an area of inquiry. So for example, this is uh, Turing's paper on, um, like this, this paper here, on computable numbers with an application to this problem. I don't know how to pronounce that, but... Um, and so this is kind of going on about comp some form, some, uh, you know, thing about uh, computation and computability. And so it just kind of lays out the problem, um, kind of, you know, what you might, you know, computing machines, uh, definitions. Uh, then you have a table maybe with some examples. Uh, so you're laying out an example of what you're thinking. You know, if you think about like a, a thought experiment, that's that's a good thing to put in a vision paper because it gives, it kind of lays out the problem out very cleanly. Um, you have um, some other things. Maybe I'll go to a different one that might be a little bit better. Um, Alan Kay's paper. So this is, I think this is the one that was, yeah, this is a personal computer for children of all ages. So this apparently inspired the iPad and other types of products. This is his uh, initial description of the Dyna book. So this is written in 1972. So, you know, a lot of the things we have today that we think are futuristic, kind of the roots in the 60s and 70s. But anyways, this is uh, just laying out this idea of a personal computer. They didn't have to, I don't think they do any real like technological work here. It's like sketches. So they're talking about like what it should look like. So this looks like an iPad, right? You have people, uh, kids interacting with a uh, slate. And, you know, at the time we knew what slates were, we knew what notebooks were, but we were trying to build like a digital version of that. And so, you know, you're taking mental models from what we know and you're kind of putting it into a, a practical example. So he actually does some narrative in here where he imagines the kids interacting with these things. Um, and again, this is way before we had like, network you know like wi-fi networks or uh computers that you could you know touch screens or anything like that it's just kind of laying out this vision uh and then this is the dyna book in education so this is of course using an ipad for education as we would do today but this is a dyna book so it's you know it's a very it's very prescient in a lot of ways but but sometimes these things serve as inspiration. So I'm sure the I, iPad people, when they were designing it, they, they referenced this paper. They knew what kind of what Kay's vision was, and then they took it upon themselves to make a, a actual model of that technology. Um, then, you know, the, the, they called the talking typewriter, uh, <laughs> which is like, you know, this is something that is <laughs> seems a little archaic, but that's, you know, at the time, you had typewriters that, uh, I mean, you didn't really have personal computers yet, so you had to use an analogy that people could understand. So it's the talking typewriter, okay. Um, and then you lay it out, you lay out some... Actually, this is interesting, uh, kind of going back to the psychology of it. Um, let me see if I can zoom in on this. 
Uh, so this is actually talking about stages of development from Piaget and kind of talking about so also Bruner and talking about some of the things, different senses here and different ages that are, uh, you know, acquired. So this, this vision paper is very much focused on children learning in a, a computational environment and going back to the developmental stages and thinking about like what's best for kids you know, at different ages and what can they interact with? What, when, what are these things that are, you know, we're starting to get things that are coming online in the child. Um, and so what are the best modes of interaction for children, maybe versus adults, or maybe taking advantage of some of these things. So, you know, it's like, you know, putting together a lot of ideas, really kind of thinking broadly about a problem. Um, and then this is of course the machine, uh, which is, of course, you know, you have the keypad. They didn't imagine the touch screen the way we have it now. <laughs> it's just files on this on this screen. But, you know, uh, they actually, did, I don't know if they had a touch screen. Looks like there was a stylus and a keyboard. So, you know, this is the kind of thing you would use for, you know, laying out a vision of something. Then this is sort of the structure, how it should be done, or it's been done in the past. There are a lot of other uh, examples here. So... You know, we have uh, this one here, Alexander Rich, on the RNA world as a precursor to modern biology. And so this is, again, from 1962, on the problems of evolution and biochemical information transfer. So it kind of goes through sort of this idea uh, of uh, what RNAs do and kind of laying out that world, you know, that worldview. And then, um, you know, kind of is leading now to technologies that we use RNA for. And we know kind of what it does and everything. So there are different things that were, um, you know, like this book, Engines of Creation by Eric Drexler, which is on molecular nanotechnology. Uh, John Wheeler, who did some other work in modern physics. So these are uh, different uh, ways you can do vision papers. And he kind of lays out some of these things uh, the immediate motivator for the present notes is a combination of observations I find surprising. Uh, one, vision papers often play a crucial role in investigating new fields of science. So they have to sort of lay things out from like the existing science, existing metaphors, but they also kind of point to things that you can do with those. So RNA was discovered and then like, what does it do? What, what is it useful for? You can put a vision paper together to say, I propose that this is good this finding that someone made is good for these things. And we can synthesize what we know about it and then you know, maybe translate it into technologies. Um, B, the kind of thinking they involve is a type, of, type that scientists don't often publicly do much of. Uh, and then C, indeed, the style of thinking involved is sometimes disparaged by many scientists or sometimes all scientists. And you have, if you've heard of the term ahead of your time, that's often what these papers are but they they are somewhat influential if they're if they're on the nose and so these papers contain fewer no technical results or literal little or no data they may in fact not hew to the usual standards of any existing field as a consequence the contents of vision papers tend to be radically different than most conventional scientific papers they're often storytelling or narrative creation with few technical results and sometimes appear superficially closer to literature than what most people would consider to be science. So there it is, uh, you know, the, the vision paper, it's not like, it wouldn't be in the typical standards of a scientific paper, but it's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be like a sort of laying out a vision for things. And sometimes they're very prescient, like we saw at the Alan Kay paper, uh, that, you know, it lays out basically what, what something should look like and then someone goes, someone else goes to build it, or they go and they build technologies on top of this vision but, you know, it's important to have that vision in place because you can't just build something great <laughs> without any sort of vision. It's just kind of hard to do, hard to have that, not, not have that step involved. Yeah, that's great. When I, I couldn't, I couldn't see, I finally reached my destination and I'm set. When you first started talking, I'm like, oh, it's cool. Bradley wants to talk about vision, like, uh, you know, like, like ocular vision, oh. or computer vision. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Nice. But I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, this is very, this is exactly what, kind of what we've been talking about lately. So I kind of, 
I'll go back and watch the full thing. Um, yeah. But please, like, post the links to those in Slack, of course, because uh, that's that's partly what I'm what we're working on in some of some of what we're trying to do. So that's very cool to hear all that. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> all right. Uh, did you have an update, by the way? I know we missed out. <laughs> oh, yeah. I have a bunch of updates, so that's kind of why I wasn't really in a hurry to do them. Um, I can do this here. Um, yeah, I don't even know where to begin. Um, it's, been a, it's been a very good week. There's been a lot of stuff that's happened this week. Um, we've kind of... I think... Uh, if in a little bit, if we have time, I don't know how much, I'm a little bit curious how to structure the rest of today's meeting, because so there's so much stuff um, yeah. available to talk about. Uh, I wouldn't mind going over some of the cognition features or the We Robot posters, but yeah. it may be hard for me to show them currently. Um, maybe in a little bit I can do that. Okay. But basically, my, my, I'll, just, I'll just stick to my update for now, I guess. Um, since last week, I finished both of the posters for oh. We Robot in a, in a draft form. They will, uh, I'm happy to revise them a bit in terms of some of the content. I did a little bit of an unorthodox layout because it's, they're not gonna look like your typical posters and, and, and they're not supposed to either. So it was a little bit tricky for me in that sense because one, We Robot, We Robot isn't like, when you think about your typical poster, you think about like, here's your methods, here's your research, here's your conclusion, here's your introduction, here's how you did it, here's the graph with your data, and that's not at all what, what the case is. And I don't, I, not only really for ourselves right now with these things, because we don't really have, you know, we don't have, have done a bunch of data that we're going to turn into a bar graph, but um, I, I think all of the posters that we robot with how their session is set up in particular are going to be conceptual and like they're, they're very i think this is the case for a lot of posters but especially for we robot like they were like this is for work in progress sorts of things anyway so it kind of affected how i put them together and i want to tweak a bit of the, the headings but i kind of followed a bit of a generic for for both posters i followed a similar format which is basically kind of the s s c q a or like situation, complication, question, and answer. I kind of use that format to set them up. Both of them, one of them, the cognitive interfaces stuff, and the other kind of the world, uh, digital humanities, navigating and navigating the world, digital world stuff. Um, and then for the cognitive, the cognitive one, uh, the interfaces one, is basically looking at, I did a bit of a, I basically did a review. I did, I did a similar review to what we did with uh, existing virtual technologies. Um, sorry, airplane. I did a kind of review. Here's some some specific technologies that are assisting disabled people, basically right now, which which I which I showed in the lab before, and then I basically mentioned the methodology project and kind of the cognition futures frontier map project, which I, I have some more, um, I have updates to say about that as well, and, and specific, like, what is the Cognition Futures resource database looking like, and how can we build with that? Because I think that's going to be, I have I have my vision for that, and I just haven't had any time in the last day and a half to, to put it into Notion, but there's, I think, I think we're going to be using Notion a bit more, um, and, and I... That's something I want to talk about too, in the sense of I I want to make sure people have access to it the way they need to, because I want them to be able to add things to it. Um, and I'm not sure if I need to give them different permissions or whatever else. But um, so to leave it at that, um, the We Robot is set. It's it's wow. It's uh twenty five ish days from now. Um, I have my tickets. I have my hotels. It was really funny, by the way. Um, just because you get offered a group rate at a hotel through the conference doesn't necessarily mean it's actually good or even the best one available. Because I don't know if it's like, 
because I missed some super discount earlier hotel rate, but I just went on the website to the exact same, not even like Hopper or Travelpedia or whatever those like special discount. I literally just went to the website for the hotel and was searched for the dates. I found a better offer than what they offered me with the group discount. So for those people traveling for conferences, maybe check that out sometimes. <laughs> um, anyway, um, I have the hotel. I have, I, I have I have time in Seattle set up, um, which is great. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, to that end, if there's things I can do for the lab or for our interests in Seattle, let me know because I have some time to plan and prepare and network and contact. I already have a few things in the works. Um, I, I'm meeting some sort of friends and colleagues there, which would be great. But also, we robot will be a really good um, uh, environment for a lot of things related to the society ethics tech team too. Um, but also, I kind of mentioned this last time. I would really like to have a way to talk about the Google Summer Code work, and I'm kind of thinking either of some kind of. I think it would be really cool if we did a like a video interview. I would my my my. My dream for this would be, like, if we could get the, the Google Summer Code folks in a 10, 15, 10 to 20 minute jam session, just kind of talking about stuff, where we talk about the project, the technical work, but also a little bit of time, because we haven't had much time to talk about it, a little bit of time in terms of like the social or philosophical or societal implications for it too, because we robot is kind of geared towards Open source, or uh, the 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 the, F, the it, it, it's based, it's hosted in the law school, so it's very law focused. And, and kind of one of the main organizers is Ryan Kala, who's a main who's a part of uh, AI debate number two. When Gary Marcus kind of brought him as as a law and ethics person to, to kind of anchor the, dis the discussion from that side of things. Um, so that that was I, I'm looking forward to doing stuff with that community in specific, but I feel like being able to show off Google Summer Code, being able to show off, um, uh, giving people the opportunity to talk about that as well might be very useful and might be a way for us to get really good feedback, but also like if people are interested in, I know, I mentioned there's also, I know, I, I know Brian is kind of working on continuing his project or a variation of things like that in the future. I don't know if other folks want to do that too. I know there's been different evolutions of the projects, but like if if there's if there's um, I'll just put it I'll just put it this way: the opportunity is ripe in in Seattle for a lot of uh, expanding our work and our presence to people who probably haven't heard of it. Um, so anything that comes to your mind to that end, um, let me know. And I'll, I'll continue to reach out about the Google Summer Code stuff. At the very least, it might just be a very simple, I draft up like three or four questions and ask all the participants to say, hey, what do you think about this and this and this and then that, and then I put it in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a blog post, you know, that's fine too. Um, but as long as we have something to point to, I think that might be very wise. Yeah. Um, any questions or comments about those things before I say other stuff? <clears throat> when do you want to like? Uh, when is the We Robot conference? Twenty-five days. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I think we should be kind of at the official end of GSOC by then. So I mean, that's because I want to make sure that people had their projects in hand uh, before we did that. Like, I, you know like to have like a uh, conclusion to their projects and then we could say mm. because I, you know i don't want it to be work in progress when we do the video because it's like well what's so we want to do like uh you know you have the final submission and then we can have the discussion about like well you know what did you learn what you know what was the final project what did you submit and you know i think it'd be great for uh each of our gsoc people for this year to to give a very short introduction to their project maybe how it's useful uh you know and it does i i think 
uh, Hussein is is kind of shifted away a little bit from open source, but it's still in that society ethics and technology area. So that's I mean you know we can make that a little broader, but there are a lot of legal questions even around like some of these other things. So it's definitely yeah. like uh, you know I think it would be nice to have like maybe even individually just kind of a couple minutes. And then we can put that together into like a little yeah. a presentation. I, 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 I don't, I, I think it'll be, I think it's a lofty reach goal to have like a scripted uh, or a, a, a group session. So I think I wouldn't mind doing either, either it could just be literally um, people recording it themselves or like a, an interview or a faux interview where I'm basically. The questions are the same for everybody. You know, you've seen the promo pieces before. They ask a bunch of people the same questions, and they, they clip out who's different. Who, you know, okay, oh, here's Brian's answer. Here's Mark's answer. Here's, you know, Zane's answer. They just, they just, like, slice them the right way, and it looks nice or something like that. <laughs> and that's, you know, we're not we're not um, a major production company, but we can do something similar to that for sure. Yeah. Um, so I think it would be a really nice thing also, like a really – I think it would be a really good thing for We Robot, but also, like, it overlaps kind of kind of where i'm going with all this stuff is like it overlaps significantly Bradley and i had the good fortune and the the the, the, the wonder of like enough time and and uh all this other like good stuff where we actually met twice this week and focused partly on some of my stuff and part and a lot of like i made in planning stuff which is great and i know one of the things that came up from that and we've had discussions about is like all right so thinking about the future thinking about like like this material like if we make if we make a nice thing with this it will serve so many purposes throughout the next year we can kind of reference the video open house we can reference the video um at if a neuro match comes up we can reference the video like throughout the year as as a process by which um to mention our association with icf and google summer code but also like um you know the, the I think the organizations themselves, there was an email where the organizations were like, hey, why don't you make a, a, a promotional video talking about your, your summer of code stuff anyway? And currently, Orthogonal itself isn't an organization, but we're through the INCF. So we can't directly, we don't have direct access to do it through Google Summer of Code directly. We're going to do our own version of it as well, which wasn't, that wasn't, believe it or not, that wasn't actually even my motivation for what I just said, but it overlaps pretty strong. Like, it's basically the same thing um, or, or fairly equivalent to it. Um, so I think that's a really good thing, too. And also, like, um, you know, Sam finished her blog post, which is great, and then I were about to publish her... It, it's kind of like a... I basically did, like, a, the same thing where I turned what she said into kind of a generic interview and a highlight of the questions. Like, oh, like, uh, what did you do this summer? Or like, how long have you been here? And, uh, you know, I, I, like I, I prompted the questions based off of what she wrote and made it into an interview kind of format. Not saying to do a bunch of interviews, but more like, I think there are ways to, I would slide this into the bit of the professional development mentoring researcher stuff, because you're going to have to get used to communicating your ideas this way too. Um, and I think, the more we get used to doing that, the more that's a regular part of what we do, I think that will only be beneficial for us. So there's been a lot of thoughts along these lines this week. Um, and and again, like everybody's been doing a lot of really good things in these areas in general. So the more we can, you know, make it somewhat accessible to other people or reference later, like Bradley said at the start, I think before, maybe before Sam uh, got here, but we went over to the blogs. Like being able to have this and just point to this and say, "Oh yeah, here's my link or my ideas or something I did," it can spark conversation so much. If that doesn't exist on somewhere on the internet, you know, it's 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 sort of a not an operational point of interface. But then once this once is there, it's like, oh, it will it can be there. And you can reference it at any time and. It could spark a lot of conversations, either casually or when you're networking specifically or whatever. So it's very, very good thing to do. Um, yeah. Uh, so that's my 
feel about that. I don't know what word to use for that. Um, as far as other updates go, um, I think I can. I'm I'm once again um, wearing my hat at by the water because I have this strong feeling that I'm not going to be able to do this much anymore. So um, that's one thing. Um, secondly, or however many number now. Um, we have been talking about open house stuff. We have been talking about dev, dev AI stuff and kind of the longer term vision of that for the fall. That's going to be something we pick up again in the fall. We're talking about interns. Um, Brian has a unique situation where um, I believe you basically are getting the opportunity to continue some of your work and then you need some teammates through the, so what, your what is, course. Is it a, it's like a class that all computer science majors have to take called Capstone Project and you either yeah, are yeah. or conceive of a project. And, and yeah, um, I've proposed continuing the GSOC research um, as a project, specifically making a, a web component. And my professor so far has been like, yeah, that sounds great. Sounds good. So um, I'll, I'll start reaching out to uh, classmates once class starts and tell them what's going on and see if any of them want to work on it. OK, so it is within that class you need teammates, right? OK, cool. Um, yes, specifically within the class. So, yeah, and I don't know. Mm, no, it, you probably wouldn't be able to get help from outside that class, even if they got academic credit through Albany, right? That's like specific to that class. I would ask your professor if you're interested in it, but you probably wouldn't need it or don't want it. Um, Cause like we could ask Casey to try to make it work somehow, but you don't, I, I, I get the sense that what you're doing will be fine as it is. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, also, I should mention on the academic credit front for doing an internship with Orel, for example, um, if you wanted to do it through the computer science department, you would have had to have already gone through the process months ago. Um, but there's still time to do it uh, for regular Albany internships. Yeah, yeah. Every department is a little bit different. Um, and I, I think I think for for computer, I haven't, I'm not part of that department. I wasn't specifically part of that department because I think they have a particularly particular system about it. Um, but th there is definitely options for some other folks uh, who want to do that. Um, okay, great. Uh, but that'll be that'll be very exciting. Like you can you get you get some you get a little bit of like leadership experience with that um with within your group there and i think it'll be cool for you and happy to i think they'll be a great thing for like i'm per as someone who envisioned having a relationship with the albany or my alma mater and making a program like it's very cool for me to see like oh like this is kind of you know as, as the nobody uses the saying i've never I've, the only person i've heard saying use the saying in the last like three years is me but it used to be said all the time by my older professors so like oh it, it grew legs and then it took off on its own and it's like it, it feels funny for it to be so anachronistic now but like it has it has grown and I, honestly i didn't understand like why like it was always a strange term for me which is kind of why i'm, I'm fascinated with it now it didn't make sense to me like well okay it's something grew legs it's like all right but you know the idea that it, it took off and and grew into something and became an adult or engaged the world in a way but yeah that's cool um but yeah like like sam said also uh it's it's the start of the semester so we have to i think it'll be good to actually this weekend ideally kind of like um wrap up some of our internship IDs and internship calls, just really for you Albany and, and Casey stuff. Uh, that should kind of happen as, as soon as possible at this point. And we've done a lot of the work to do that. The only other kind of related stuff I'll say along these lines is um, both in terms of some 
not front end work, some some deeper unpleasant, not not sexy like database information science library organization work. Um, I I have done some work, and I don't really, I don't know what to say. I I think I think it's kind of just for the whole lab. It's gonna be the the vision. I may try to show this in a, in a second, but the vision is basically going to be like you can go to the um, notion space, and then they're just going to be kind of it's going to be almost like making your own Wikipedia of sorts. But like if like I'm going to have a section for like people, you can put Mobile Winer, you can put. Um, the people we mentioned today, um, Adam, I forget who, Adam Saffron and Adam like Mulhoon or something. Um, you can put you can put people there. You can put some concepts. You can put some of the positions they hold. You can put debates, and just kind of starting to really flesh out this. It's basically what the the frontier map is supposed to look like. Um, and but but I wanted it. I was like, dude, should I put this just? In, a specific branch of it but then it's like no like i'll just make it so that way anything in the notion space which kind of covers basic oral stuff and the ethics team and condition features if you just link the databases in with a notion the right way it will be fairly functional and it'll be a little bit difficult to do some of the setup work but once it's set and once i can show I don't even, I, I'm not even going to bother to show right now because it might just sound too complicated. But once you see it, I think it will be actually fairly easy to do and and update. And you can say, oh, like this this stub was updated by or, or worked on by whoever, you know, if you want to do that way. Um, and I think that'll be a fun thing to do. But I think that I, I put in some work there. Um, I've done, I've been doing this a bit with some of my other outside of lab work. Um, and then it kind of just struck me like, well, I could do it in this way too. And it'd be pretty useful instead of having a lot of disparate ideas. Um, yeah, so that that's happening. And then finally, the last thing I'll say is um, we're, we talked about Google Summer of Code and having a public facing piece for it. And I think basically the the, the um, oh just to say this for condition future stuff um, we didn't we didn't progress the book at all this week because of a variety of things and the fact that it was mostly just Bradley and I talking about stuff anyway so that became a, a jam session so there's no people aren't behind or anything like that just to say that yeah. um, but but um, it the uh, intent in, in association with being ready to, to ask to, to, to kind of step out for, for um, requesting interns and calls for involvement um, to, on my to-do list for this weekend is some kind of front one page front page introduction for all the projects that we're currently going to be pushing. So Cognition Futures, the methodology project, the Zydee ethics team, maybe Dev AI. Just, just like, even if it's just a paragraph or a couple paragraphs in, in a generic image, it, I think that would be really useful um, for people coming to look and say, okay, I want to join, I want to join the lab. What am I doing? You know, and, 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 and yeah, so that's, I think that's explanatory enough for that. Um, but that's uh, any other updates I have broadly. Um, I think I posted a few things in Slack, uh, but um, that, that's it for now. That's 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 okay. a lot of stuff. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to get feedback on the posters, uh, maybe this, this at the reading group Wednesday also, so just putting that out there. And if I can, I might get them set up in a little bit, but I know we're kind of, uh, 
burning on time here. Yeah. Uh, so we have a half an hour left. But yeah. yeah, I'll leave it at that. If anybody wants to say any comments, or we can move on to the next thing. Uh, well, yeah, actually, I was very interested in the thing, the notion space that you're making. So this is like something we, I think Amanda's been working on some things related to cybernetics on that. And we have have some things on the uh, GitHub also that are like stubs. So is this something that is like, um, I don't know, I guess I'm interested in what it is. And if it's something that is more like a wiki or like a reference that you would go through. I mean, because it's, it's, uh, I don't want to duplicate efforts. I want to be able to have like something that's like a, a nice thing that people can navigate if that's something that we're all working towards. Um, did you have, oh, there's Jesse again. Uh, did you, uh, okay. Are you still there, Jesse? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I don't, I don't know if you want to. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have a good example to show right now that I can show because I have examples, but they're not, they're not things I can show right now okay. to, they're, they're not, my examples that I have available are not, um, public. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, that's fine. I mean, I just want to make sure that we're kind of planning in the same direction on that. And that oh, we yeah. make it, um, yeah. as far as as far as that goes, um, I mean, uh, I mostly see um, Notion as a much higher accessibility. Hold on. It will be a place to store our notes, and and. I feel like there really isn't a central, like, yes, there's been stuff that I've thrown into some things on GitHub, but nobody looks at them and, and they aren't, it's very hard to build on them. Notion is a place to, um, you can go in and just make your stuff. It, it, it'll be much easier to show later this week or next week, uh, cause I just have not been able to put it in here and the, the version of what I'm showing, what I can show, is um, proprietary at this time for other stuff. Okay. So um, I'll, I'm pretty confident it will be something that, because I know I know we've kind of had a lot of like, oh, let's do this and this and this and this and put this here. I think this will be. I'm fairly confident this will be something that can be built out a lot more and be stable over time. And also be more. Um, I want to use the word accessible, but like it'll be much much easier to find stuff in Notion because of how it's built, and you can search it that way. And it'll basically be creating a few different tables, and then interrelating the databases. Like you can have a database table for people or concepts or ideas, and then within those have a lot of interlinking stuff. Kind of, it's sort of like, not really a Wikipedia, but more like a, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll show you as soon as I can. Okay. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, I see that Ankit has joined us. How are you? I know you've been working on a paper oh. submission that you got accepted. So uh, how's that going? Yeah. Yeah, I've been editing. So just exceeding like two pages. So we just need to figure out like, I think there's probably one section that maybe you can like tell me like we can remove maybe, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I left you some notes in the Slack in a, in a DM. And I just kind of like all the comments from the reviewers I kind of gave a response to. But yeah, if there's yeah, something yeah, that yeah, you... Yeah, I noticed that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, okay. took it to, uh, I made the changes with respect to that. Okay, yeah. In the new, like, the new formatting. Okay, the, yeah. The conference formatting. So I made that, but still somehow, probably, I think it's the format, it has a lot of padding. So oh. probably because of that, like, it's just 
one two pages extra. I don't want to like pay them right, extra. Right, right. <laughs> so yeah, I, we'll take a look at that. Like what uh, section maybe we want to like exclude. Okay. Yeah. If you could send me the formatted version, I can mark it. Yeah. 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 Okay. And also, like, I'm also most likely not submitting the appendix as well because I feel that suggestion bit unnecessary. I'm just maybe going to put the link of my GitHub repository. Yeah, that yeah, should be enough, I think. Yeah, actually, you could put the you could put the uh, appendix in the GitHub repository as a PDF too, and you could just provide a link if if that's something. Because oh. I mean, you know, you can oh, store yeah, yeah, a lot yeah, of people will right, do that. Yeah, yeah. You could link the GitHub repository, and over there, yeah, I can upload my appendix. Yeah. 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 Okay, that's a good idea. Yeah. So, uh, what's going on over here? Uh, you are submitting to Neuromatch. Any yeah. idea? What's going on? Yeah. So, I mean, that's a, that's a good segue to like kind of discussing what people want to do for Neuromatch. I, I know that Ankit has things, and maybe we could do something, submit something with Ankit. And Jesse has some things, and I, I have some things, but we have to strategize because uh, you can only submit one mm. submission per person, and so. I, I don't know what people want to do. I mean, there's like different, a lot of different things we're interested in, but uh, maybe making it something that is like something we can do in like seven minutes, because I think that's how much time we have for the presentation. So, you know, it has to be something really kind of focused and it has to be something interesting to learn of a computational neuroscience crowd. Uh, that being said, you know, you could have something like a philosophy oriented paper or um, you know something with like neuroimaging oriented, but it has to be kind of in that area. So I know Ankit and I uh, submitted something on switching last time, and that was uh, you know interesting. Uh, you know, it had like it was neuroscientific, it was like algorithmic, and there were some other examples in there. So the, you know that yeah. So I don't know if you have Ankit, if you wanna. I don't know if, if the paper that you're working on right now. If that's something that's suitable for the uh, neuro match, I don't necessarily think it is because it's not really oriented towards. Yeah, not yeah. really because it's a continuation of that poster itself. So yeah, I don't think. Yeah, well, I mean, if if we have something else that we want to do, uh, we could we could go and dust off the the one we did before and update it, um, you know, or or whatever. Um, so I, I made a, I don't have the table with me here, but I've made a table, uh, where it's just a very simple table where we're going to have like people who are interested in some topic, um, you know, kind of, I don't know how to do this. I guess we could have people, I could in the Neuromatch channel, open up like a thread where we can, or Jesse can do it if he wants, uh, where we can say, I want to commit to this topic. Uh, and just it's count accountability for yourself because you're going to be the one submitting it. Or if you want to work with someone else in the group, you can submit it and, you know, figure out who's going to submit it. And then, um, you know, basically write up the abstract, but it's like a 200 word abstract by September 5th. So in a couple weeks. And so once we get that in place, you just submit it through their portal. Then we, we say, okay. Now you've submitted the abstract. Uh, now you need to produce a seven and a half minute or so set of slides by in the Neuromatch 5 is, I think, at the end of September. So it's a couple weeks after the abstract. So this is an accountability mechanism again. You know, um, if you can get the abstract out in that time, then you've got it. Then you can get to the, the slides. Then you have to make the slides. I think you also have to record it. Uh, yourself speaking uh but that's you know and then once you have that then that's it <laughs> but you have to think of it in stages you can't just say i'm going to do the whole thing in the night um and you know so i, I don't know what people in topical interests are here uh what what they might think is ready to go um and and, and one more word on that you know it doesn't have to be like really polished work it can be something that's very um uh, you know, kind of an idea that you might want to play out for people. It's, it, people have done that. Does anybody have like ideas right now that they're thinking about just to kind of freelance talk about that? 
Yeah, certainly. You know, I, I've I've been thinking about these these um, physics uh, physics informed neural nets as as solutions for for inverse prob you know inverse problems and in, in case of neuro imaging um, and specifically um, using uh, this nice little test case of um, um, I forget what Jean calls her her. Um, particular setup, but it's a, it's a, it's a, just a 2D version of, of a neuroimaging inverse problem. And um, she's already got this, uh, I can post some links on, on what, uh, what she's developed, but it would be uh, again, a nice, a nice demonstration. What of, kind of was it? Is it taken? What was the topic? Some kind of nets. Uh, yeah, it, phys physics, physics informed or inspired neural nets. Um, so pins, and, uh, and in particular for for inverse problems. So um, uh, a lot of the a lot of the high density EEG work and, and MEG work is is focused on you know finding the the source of, of the electrical activity or electromagnetic activity and um, and you know how well you can characterize that especially deep sources so you know I get asked a lot like you know how, how sensitive are we to say hippocampal activity from you know from these what are essentially far field measurements right and um, uh, but what's nice about Gene's uh, particular test rig, which again, it's a 2D uh, EIT setup, is that she can also, uh, I mean, she set this up so you can inject current into the, into the material that you're, you're probing, you know, that you, you, want, to, um, you want to look at. Um, uh, still need to add a few, I mean, you need some, some hardware uh, to make the, uh, to make the, the kind of test cycles in there, but um, um, again, this can all be done in software without her particular particular example. Um, and uh, this is um, yeah. So uh, I can think a little bit more about the software stack for this, but um, there's sure. already a good yeah. Sorry. It's a good. Was, uh, kind of, yeah. yeah. Um, I think we could talk more about that in depth, but I also want to see if anybody else has any other yeah. like ideas yeah. that there are, are, I think they might want to be putting on, um, or like specific things they may want to talk about. It, they can be the, the first person on, on the abstract, or we can, we can sort out who's submitting what later, but like specific things they want to, um, topics they would want to submit to mirror match. Uh, we'll definitely do the cockside method stuff. I don't know if you want to try to do a dev AI thing um, or what you had in mind, Bradley, but just to kind of list them out. Um, yeah, I think that would be good to have a dev AI. I don't know how to, well, I'll, I'll think about how to present that because it's, uh, yeah, there's a vision, uh, maybe a little bit more than a vision at this point, but uh, definitely like having like laying it out for people because I think I've done this at EI workshop uh, in 21 where we laid out the this this uh, this roadmap and you know kind of making progress on that so I've, I've got uh, you know progress to report we've got some papers out we've got some general concepts I think people would find that interesting it's a little hard to do it in seven and a half minutes but that's kind of a a challenge that you know you have to make like if someone asks you for an elevator pitch for a really hard idea you just have to go ahead and figure out how to do that <laughs> so yeah i'll probably do something in dev ai um anybody else have anything like on their mind i know i know uncle's here sam or brian or amanda and like piquing your interest in something this isn't it be this isn't a final commitment this is this is this is Tentative, uh, but like you know, um, I don't even 
Can people actually see my screen? Yeah, yeah. That's what mm -hmm. the item isn't, there's no like turn off your screen button anymore. But anyway, um, anything people want to throw tentatively put out there, something they might want to work on. You can, you can be a collaborator on the other projects too, but like something they might want to see put into a, a submission for abstract or for your match. Yeah, I feel like my interests are very well represented and I'm looking forward to being a collaborator on um, whatever kind of brings everyone's ideas together. Okay. Any other ideas? Otherwise, we can move on. But this is just, I just wanted to make a list just to kind of get started. Yeah, well, I mean, we can we can add in. If people have ideas, um, you know, that's up to whatever they want to do. If they, if they think it's something they can do, um, and if you need, like, if you have an idea you think you may, may or may not be able to pull off, like, let us know. I can give you feedback on that. i tell you if it's something that's doable. But I think it's a good opportunity if you can do something, uh, you know. Um, but, yeah, I think we should do, like, a Cogsite Methods um, and definitely kind of focus on that, like, kind of put together the uh, abstract and then maybe solicit some slides from different people. So... You know, th these are talks that have multiple authors, so. Um, yeah, and also, yeah. like, it may very well be that if if you, like, for people in the reading group or people who may be joining soon and watching the video about the reading group and, and the methods project, like, you don't think just because I, like, uh, that's not necessarily like, oh, Jesse's going to submit that whole project. No, like there's there are different components to it. Like if you want to have a, uh, like look at a specific method or go over, even like going over some of the Morella work could be could be turned into a presentation for Neuromatch and and kind of just saying, oh, here's here's what we learned and here's sort of the implications for it. Um, that's something that uh, could be its own thing. Um, and, and even for like, because I, I think you're going to have some uh, interns or, or just people who haven't been active in the lab maybe coming back soon and, and wanting things to focus on and I feel like there's actually a lot of there's a lot of specifics underneath these broader projects that we could uh, be using for that so yeah yeah it, you know we might even do like a summary of the reading group is sort of like an advertisement um, I don't know like maybe we just focus on a couple of salient issues like I know we were talking about neural phenomenology and some of these other things, but I mean that's a possibility too. It's it's, it's pretty broad. They're pretty uh, accepting of things. I know Jesse did one year where he did like something like that, where he did a overview of cognition futures as like a sort of historical narrative, or like as a you know progress in type of thing. So um, yes. yeah, and there's also like a bunch of. Um a heavy acceptance of like philosophy behind neuroscience and cognitive science too uh so we could have a specific thing about tailored to that as well and i think that might be appealing to um i don't know if sadhana will be with us um but like there's a few people who've expressed interest in, in that specifically anyway um keep that in mind uh, Inkit said, what did he miss? Well, we were just trying to figure out the different potential uh, submissions to Neuromatch. So, and, you know, as I, Jesse, you can make that notion, I guess, public or I don't know. I mean, because we want to go back and consult it later or add to it. Oh, yeah, that 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 specific. I just pulled up that page just to think of this okay. right now. Yeah, that, that won't be like a. I mean, we can make a neuron mesh space in Notion too, though. Um, but yes, yeah, for sure. Okay. Good. Um, and then, of course, so that's neuron match. And then, longer term, we have this open house idea. So, I don't know if anyone, I don't know if anyone wants to commit to anything, but I just wanted to remind people that we want to do like different people can do different presentations on their work or whatever, like Morgan talked about, maybe doing a Neurotech X related talk. Uh, maybe the GSOC students could do a talk. And, you know, if you're, if you're 
in leading a project or an initiative, you definitely want to give a short talk on that. Um, nothing, no details on it right now. We, we're kind of still working out the uh, different lengths of time that we want to spend on things. So uh, if you have a topic, you know, you can actually you could propose your own time period. So we could do like five minutes or 20 minutes, depending on what it is that you're talking about. Um, you know, if it's like a small area, like if you're just trying to, you know, get something off the ground or if you want to lay out a vision, you know, you can reserve that time, you know, and that's fine. Um, I don't want to force people to give like a 30 minute talk on something that maybe is about 10 minutes. Um, but on the other, on the other hand, I want people to be able to get their ideas out in front of the lab. This, this is why we're doing this. Um, so I know, um, even if like someone like Ankit who isn't, you know, he's doing a lot of work, um, and he might want to talk about how some of his ideas interface with some of the topics you know we're talking about in other areas um like in terms of his algorithmic work uh that you know that would be good too um so i mean you know it's it's pretty it's pretty broad i just i want to facilitate interactions with people so i want people to kind of give a talk and then think maybe about how their work fits into some of these other areas and then people see it and they think about it and they have other things to say about it like oh yeah this is interesting for my area because i don't think about this sort of thing much um that's that's what i want to elicit so that that's the kind of thing that we want to focus on on these talks it can be any length and so please if you have ideas please let me know we have an open house channel in the slack too yeah um like i think for the open house like uh i think i think there definitely will be like some broader overview stuff for the lab for google we already mentioned google some code there's dev ai and like sort of the, the main there's like those bigger banners but i think in the bit like those maybe will be like i think they might be slightly different in nature than like an actual talk. Like if you want to give a talk about a paper you've written, like I know there's a bunch of papers we kind of collaborated on before, or uh, like part of your um, things you've been reading as part of their reading group or other stuff. Um, those would be more like an actual host, like host your own talk and talk about what you want. Um, so I think those will be, oops, sorry. Those will kind of be a separate thing, uh, but more, more like the meat, the actual like meat and potatoes of the stuff. Like those will be, those will be the, the things where we actually have more discussion about to do one. Oh, well, let's talk about, um, you know, this person's actual interest and work in this area. So I'm putting these here, but don't, don't let them think, oh, well, geez, there's so much here. I can't, I can't say anything. This is, no, this is more like, I don't know open house um admin work yeah <laughs> uh, and not like uh presentation yeah so yeah i think that's good to have like topical presentations too uh if that's something people want to do just in terms of maybe getting a area out there we don't talk about very much yeah okay so that's good. Uh, we'll put we'll get this together. Uh, you know, the target is kind of by the end of the year, but it doesn't. You know, it doesn't have to be. We, this is really dependent on people, um, and you know, and maybe it's asynchronous too because I know people have different schedules. So <laughs> we'll try to balance it out. Um, yeah. So do we have anything else? Uh, anyone else have anything you want to talk about before I move on? Uh, just just wanted to make a pitch for um, California brain leaves. Uh, it seems like it might be relevant, Jesse. Uh, I posted that in We Robot. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, if I if I haven't already invited you to join the, the Facebook group, I I, I will. <laughs> okay. um, but please please check it out. And uh, Kira is looking for um, board members for the nonprofit. 
as well as we're looking for um, engineers and scientists who are interested in um, you know solutions for uh, those with disabilities, uh, brain brain disorders, disabilities, and providing technology that uh, you know, makes their life more uh, accessible or makes makes things more accessible and and um, yeah makes improvements. Yeah. Oh, my. Oh no, no, no. That's great. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you. Yeah, Morgan. Um, so the final part of the meet. Let's see what time. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about some papers now. Uh, it's the last part of our meeting. And uh, so let me share my screen. And so I've already talked about some things. Uh, I'm going to talk about this topic here which is artificial embryology and developmental ai uh this is some papers that have come out in this area uh this is a little bit older paper but i just wanted to kind of you know we don't get to talk about this topic very much and we're trying to get it back in in the mainstream of the meetings um and i was going to talk about the slack too but i think for time's sake we can go over the slack maybe next week um just to say that there's some interesting posts in different channels and maybe you know if you want to go over those on your own time that's that's that would be worth doing um so this is the first paper i'm going to talk about is this developmental approach to machine learning and so it's phrased as a question and that means it's like maybe one of these vision papers we just talked about earlier uh this is linda smith who's at indiana university uh she's done a lot of stuff with like developmental psychology and I think she does the work with the GoPro cameras, putting them on babies. And um, so this is very interesting work that she does. It's sort of constructivism from a developmental perspective and, and all this. And then Lauren K. Sloan, who's from the same department. So uh, this is uh, sort of one of these vision papers. Um, the abstract reads, visual learning depends on both the algorithms and the training material. So we're talking about visual learning in babies or in humans, but you know this is also applicable for machines as well. This essay considers the natural statistics of infant and toddler egocentric vision. So egocentric means from a personal frame of reference. So it's like if I'm looking out at the world, what do I see? These natural training sets for human visual object recognition are very different from the training data fed into machine vision systems. So these natural training sets, meaning just like the environment that uh, like say a baby or a uh, person would see in the world. And so this is uh, thought of in contrast to like some of the training data that we use for machine learning. So we could talk about like, um, you know, some of the uh, image recognition benchmarks like CIFAR or some of the other data sets that exist, you know, where you have objects that are easily isolatable from its background uh, or, you know, things that are somewhat easy to see. Um, but that's not what the real world offers, of course. So the, the training sets that infants say are exposed to are very different from that. They're just natural scenes. And the infant has to extract information out of that to figure out object permanence, object recognition, and then attaching linguistic uh, labels to them. Rather than equal experiences with all kinds of things, toddlers experience extremely skewed distributions with many repeated occurrences of a very few things. So that's an interesting point uh, that you don't have these normal distributions of things. And this is some sometimes how we train algorithms. We use like Gaussian kernels, and we you know talk about like a, a well balanced training sets. But that's actually not how we experience uh, the world as toddlers in visual scenes. We experience extremely skewed distributions, which are these distributions that aren't normal in the sense in the conventional sense. They have a skew towards different things. Um, and then many repeated occurrences of a very few things. So you see a lot of the same thing. And, you know, this relates to this idea not only of, like, uh, the way we usually deal with training data, but also the out-of-distribution data set problem, which is when you see something that is out of a distribution, when you have, like, a, 
you train an algorithm on a distribution of things, and then it sees something that's outside of that distribution. Uh, what is it? What what's the experience with that? And of course, toddlers will see new things all the time that they don't have a framework for. You'll see things uh, in the world, and then you'll see this new thing pop up. And you know, uh, humans and toddlers, you know, adult humans even have to deal with this problem, but toddlers as well. And so uh, we can do this better probably than machines, and so why? That's the question. And though highly variable when considered as a whole, individual views of things are experienced in a specific order. So these, these stimuli aren't just like, you know, sort of this naturalistic view, but there are things that are experienced in a specific order. So, you know, if there's like some motion of a ball in the, in, you know, going across your field of view, you expect the ball in subsequent time points to follow a smooth trajectory. If you just show like a, a video of like a ball that skips around, like you were to take like a video of a, of a ball moving across the visual scene and, and randomize the frames so that you know the ball would pop up in different places, that would be something that would be not, not uh, expected. And so you would see, uh, in the case of the ball moving across the scene, you would see slow, smooth visual changes moment to moment and development of order transition and scene content. So this, but then, you know, in, in the opposite case, you have things that skip around the visual field. So that's harder to interpret what that means. There's a physics behind it that you infer, and it would be harder to infer those physics as well. So when you present data in this sort of developmental context, where you know you've never seen a ball moving along a trajectory before, and then you see a ball moving along a trajectory, you learn that that order is expected. Then you attach like some naive physics to it. Then you learn that there are more complex physics as you get older, and that's how you know how a ball moves across a visual scene. And then when you see it randomized like that, where the ball skips around discontinuously, then it's harder to interpret what that is, although you can still try to make an interpretation. Uh, we propose that the skewed, ordered, biased visual experiences of infants and toddlers are the training data that allow human learners to develop a way to recognize everything. So, you know, we have things that are out of distribution that we experience, but largely our, our perceptual systems are robust to these kind of new things. We can incorporate new things, all, we incorporate them all the time. Uh, you know, it's, it's questionable as to how well we do it, but we can do it, it doesn't break the system, generally. Uh, both the pervasively present entities and the rarely encountered ones. So these are things that you know you can recognize everything, put it into a framework. Um, you're not like broken by it. The joint consideration of real world statistics for learning by researchers of human and machine learning seems likely to bring advances in both disciplines. So this is actually taking this developmental perspective and thinking about the statistical properties of how we learn as, as infants and then kind of thinking about this in a machine learning context. So, um, so that, you know, this is a nice review of kind of where we are with the development and where we are with the scene statistics and all this. Uh, sort of getting, you know, she talks about some of the work they've done with head-mounted cameras uh, and they've, they've learned a lot about natural environments. So that's where a lot of these insights come from is that work. Um, and so uh, basically, you know, when you take an egocentric point of view, you have a view that's from the individual, but it also involves a lot of other things like posture, location, movement, interest, and these things change with development. So development over developmental time, there are different types of visual experience that are that you're uh, that that get uh, uh, sort of priority, and so uh, in, during the first two years of life, for example, each new sensory motor achievement, such as rolling over, reaching, crawling, walking, opens gates to new classes of visual experience. So as you learn to move when you're an infant, you you know when you're crawling around, you see the world in a certain way. Then when you start walking upright, you see the world in another way is you get taller, I guess, and, and start to do other sorts of more sophisticated uh, motor behaviors, then you learn new things about the world. So it's always about, you know, this action, 
and perception and then experiencing the world in, in, in different ways. And we've talked about this in the Cognition Futures group about experience. And we didn't really talk about the developmental aspect of that. But that's definitely a thing. You know, you have this egocentric framework. You're, do, you're interacting with the world. But in development, you're interacting in different ways. And as you start to grow and mature, these interactions change uh, in a number of ways. So this is actually quite, you know, quite important in this learning process. And of course, our, our typical machine learning platforms are disembodied. So we don't, you know, we don't have a lot of these features to draw from for a, for a artificial system. So, you know, they talk about what two-year-olds can do. There are a lot of things that two-year-olds will do. Uh, the, you know, they have a certain uh, context where they're in their bodies and they, they have their level of mental development and they can learn things from very simple inputs. So they only need one instance of a novel category and its name and they can generalize that name in different ways. They can do this with tractors or other things. Uh, they can associate names with uh, different classes of category. Um, and then there's the shape bias and development that they talk about. Um, and this is, uh, let's see here, uh, this phenomenon known as shape bias, which is where if you hear the name, if you, uh, okay, so for example, if a two-year-old encounters the very first tractor, Say a green John Deere working in a field, and a John Deere is a type of tractor. It's just a brand name. While well, hearing its name, the child from that uh, point forward will recognize all varieties of tractors as tractors, Red Massey Ferguson's, antique tractors, right on mowers, but not backhoes or trucks. So there's a shape bias in that if you see something that looks similar to the thing that you named a tractor, you'll call it a tractor. But if it doesn't look like that, then you don't call it a tractor. And, and this is in, uh, they, they have this term one-shot learning, and this is actually from the developmental literature. And it's a little bit, maybe a little bit different than the machine learning version of one-shot learning, where you're learning uh, a single, in a single shot, you're learning this uh, sort of incomplete categorization of things. But this is interesting because, you know, there, there's this parallel with machine learning, but then there's also this developmental bias that happens. And later on, you know, things get refined. But thinking about how, machines might learn. You know, we have to go through these developmental processes. Maybe we don't have to go through them, but these are some of the things that you sort of have to take into account when you're developing a system, when it's learning. And so if, it want, if you want it to learn like humans or non-human animals, you have to go through these different stages. And maybe they're very important for learning the whole context of the world. Maybe not. Um, so these are egocentric views you see from someone's perspective. They see things differently. If you're very small and on the ground, you'll see things differently than if you're a standing adult and you're looking around. Um, yeah, developmentally changing visual environments. So the visual environment changes with different age uh, levels. You know, you're seeing things differently. You're looking at different objects, your attention shifts and so forth. Um, there, there's, I mean, there's a lot of stuff here. I don't really want to go too deeply into this paper because I could get hung up on a lot of, uh, uh, things, but, uh, uh, so they, they analyze this head camera image data. Uh, it tells us about the distribution of entities in these images. It's, and when they look at like the data that's collected, so that the head mounted camera is basically a proxy for what the infant is paying attention to and seeing. They move their head. They focus on things, and the data tell us that these two-year-olds are doing neither a random sampling of entities in the world, nor do they, uh, the, the things that are presented in these egocentric images, are they uniformly distributed. So experience is extremely right-skewed. The objects in the infant's head camera images are highly selective. A very few kinds are pervasive, and most things are rare. So this is something that's interesting because we don't think about learning from machine learning perspective as being this way. We, we try to train things as very, uh, you know, even and, and Gaussian and normal, but that's actually not how humans are learning. Um, and, you know, so here is a key question. How does extensive and potentially slow learning about a few things yield a learning system that can rapidly learn about all these individually rare things? So there's a power law distribution that characterizes infant experience. 
Um, you know, there's this aspect where infants will see faces of a very few people in the first year of their life, and then later on they'll see more faces. Um, they'll see a lot of faces, or that's a lot of what they are seeing in that first year. Um, yeah, and so right skew just means in the distribution. So um, right skewed means this tail here in the in the power law. So if you were thinking right skewed was things to the right, that's not exactly what they're talking about. They just mean like that there are a few things in the distribution that they're looking at. And so everything else is down in this in this right tail, which is infrequent. Um, yeah, so then things change over time. Uh, you know, they try to master the visual invariances relative to recognizing the few objects across many different viewing conditions. So this may be a key step. You view a couple things, but you view it from different perspectives. You learn all about it, and then you uh, can generalize more easily from that. Um, and they kind of get into some experiments with uh, controlled, rear, uh, controlled rear chicks, which are, you know, baby chickens. And they try to, you know, they do a lot of like the developmental psychology uh, stuff with chicks. So chicks are a big model organism here. Um, they do, you know, they do these experiments where they look at like tightly controlling the visual environment. They move and rotate objects and they show a similarity to what humans are doing. And so it's, it's really necessary to build robust object recognition. So you need this sort of phase of building object recognition in a robust way and doing it on a, a few things and then you can start to generalize. So that's an interesting insight. Um, and then there are these uh, self-generated visual experiences. So, you know, you're doing a lot of paying attention to a lot of different things. Um, you know, either one object or you're looking at a lot of objects uh, depending on where you are in your in your life history. Um, this is an example of images captured of a single object captured by a 15 month old. So they're taking the single object, they're look, rotating it, trying to figure out what the sort of what the shape is and how it works. And so this is important. This is an important step. Uh, they're not just randomly sampling the environment. Um, so yeah, this this is a nice paper um, talking about that. This other paper uh, is from Mike Levin and in, in, in a another person I'm not familiar with. Um, this is competency of the developmental layer alters evolutionary dynamics in an artificial embryogeny model of morphogenesis. And this is maybe a bit, it's quite a bit different than the last paper, but I'll just read the abstract and then we can talk maybe a little bit about the figures or something like that. Um, biological genotypes do not code directly for phenotypes. Developmental physiology is the control layer that separates genomes from capacities ascertained by selection. A key aspect is competency, as cells are not a passive material, but descendants of unicellular organisms with complex context-sensitive capabilities. So what they do here is they use an evolutionary simulation and they try to uh, probe the effects of different degrees of cellular competency and evolutionary dynamics. So they use these virtual embryos they use a single, it consists of a single axis of positional information values provided by the cell's genomes. So what they're doing is they're looking at these virtual embryos. They're uh, sort of having the cells, uh, they're giving them properties of, of like information, uh, positional information, which is where cells kind of know where they should be in the, the embryo. So the embryo starts as the sphere and each cell has, you know, divides in it eventually figures out where it needs to be in space in the embryo. And then wherever those cells end up in the embryo de determines how they contribute later to different organs and the shape of the embryo and that developmental process. So this is very different from the psychology. This is actually uh, developmental physiology and, um, and um, embry embryogenesis. I thought we had a question here. Okay, Jesse just gave a thumbs up. Um, so this is what they're talking about here. Um, so they, they were talking, they're talking about evolutionary dynamics. They evaluated this in two modes. The first mode is this hardwired mosaic development, which is where genotype directly encodes phenotype. 
and a more realistic mode in which cells interact prior to evaluation by the fitness function in their algorithm. And this is called the regulative form of development. And we talk about this a lot in DivaWorm because the C. elegans uh, model is this sort of uh, mosaic development. So it's where the cells, it's, you know, the cells divide and it's determined in advance what the cells will become. So the cells divide and the descendant cells that differentiate into a, a certain type of cell, this is all determined by their lineage. It's not determined by any local signaling. In, in, uh, by contrast, regulative development is where a cell can become anything, it, you know, well, there are a range of things it can become depending on what it's exposed to in terms of signaling molecules and other in its position in the embryo. So like, you know, human embryos, frog embryos, uh, you know, mouse embryos, those are all regulative. You can put a, a stem cell into some liver tissue and it becomes a liver cell. In a, a, a mosaic developmental state, if you take a cell out of like the, the neural network of a C. elegans and you put it into the tail in development or even in the adult, it won't transform into anything, it'll die off. Or even like a, an early stage cell from C. elegans, it doesn't transform into anything, it just dies. So it's it, it needs to, to have its fate and it needs a specific position in the, in the uh, embryo. So this is what they're looking at. And I'm not, still not sure what they mean by minimal competency, but I think it's like maybe flexibility with respect to position or with some of these other things. So even minimal competency with respect to improving their position in the embryo results in better performance on the evolutionary surge. Crucially, we observe that as competency of cells masks the raw fitness of the genomes, the phenotypic fitness gains are then mostly due to improvements of the cell's developmental problem-solving capacities, and that's the structural genome. And I think what they mean by problem-solving capacities is this ability to, uh, you know, find its position, change its position, change its phenotype with respect to the genotype. This suggests the existence of a powerful ratchet mechanism evolution progressively becomes locked into improvements in the intelligence of the agential substrate with reduced pressure on the structural genome. A feedback loop in which evolution increasingly puts more effort into the developmental software than perfecting the hardware explains the very puzzling divergence of the genome from anatomy in species like Planaria, which is uh, Michael Levin's model organism. Um, Actually, interestingly about planaria, planaria has a lot of regeneration capacity. So if you take like a planaria worm, a flatworm, and you just take a single cell and you can extract it and you can put it into a new context and it will grow an entirely new worm. And so this is a very um, interesting divergence of genome from anatomy because that single cell has a genotype. And that, you know, you think about like C. elegans, as I said before, that single cell shouldn't really generate maybe anything or it should be in some sort of context with other cells, but this planaria can have a single cell that reproduces the entire worm. So there is no distinct, like the entire thing is basically based on a divergence from the genotype. Although, you know, you could argue, well, there's some encoding in the genotype of regeneration, which is actually, you know, they're kind of glossing over a lot of biology in this abstract. It's very I find it very stilted because it's very hard to map it to some things that we know in biology. But that's one of the things about these modeling papers is they kind of take it out of context and they kind of use different like uh, simulation tools, test different hypotheses. And it sometimes it looks a little odd because it's not really the way biology works, but they're trying to get at something that is, um, you know, some sort of fundamental mechanism. But I don't know if they've actually done that here. Um, this identifies a possible drive for scaling intelligence over time and suggests strategies for engineering the novel systems in silicone and bioengineering. So that what they're trying to do is they're trying to figure out if cells in an embryo can have this capacity that goes beyond like something that's programmed by the genome. So, you know, we think about plasticity as being like that, but plasticity allows for some flexibility of the cells. What they're looking for is sort of this plastic response that really deviates from the genotype so that the phenotype looks much different 
or that it has different types of uh, capabilities. And so, um, you know, they, they talk about these in evolutionary simulation, which I, I think is an evolutionary algorithm where they're using a fitness function to evaluate things that are generated. And then they're using this to um, kind of, you know, model this system. And they show that this process of evolution becomes locked to improvements in the intelligence. So, you know, when you have like improvements, it's, it's sort of selecting for things that are more intelligent and intelligence is based on this idea that there's this deviation from the genome. So it's very much, they're throwing a lot of words in here that I think are a little provocative, but um, you know, so the paper kind of goes through the results and it's pretty hardcore. I mean, there, there's a lot of computational details here. There's this GitHub repository for cellular competency and they're using a lot of open source tools and then they kind of go walk through their methods and I don't know if there are any good figures in here, but um, I, have, I have a bit of a question. And yeah. I don't know. I'm just curious. Are they based? Is Levin trying to get at like intelligence is related to how much, almost like in trying to increase the space in which phenotypical ish feedback can be incorporated into development itself? Well, like, I think is it like. But I think they're getting at like, could you take like an embryo where every cell was like determined to be in a certain place and then say, I can create an embryo where the cells will do whatever they, you know, they can adapt to different things and they can uh, change their position and their fate. And so you have this sort of intelligence, which is the plasticity of this embryo. So the cells can become different things as opposed to being determined to be like a uh, you know, if you had a totally deterministic embryo, it would be like this sphere that would have like maybe different fates. So you'd have this, you would be a sphere with like a head, but it would be like here and then a feet, you know, or a bottom, you know, that would be what it would look like. Uh, with what he's talking about is like, basically, how do you get like maybe uh, different asymmetries in shape eventually? How do you get cells that move away from their predetermined positions, they have this positional intelligence, which we don't, which isn't really defined positional information. Uh, how do you get all these things and how do they evolve? And that's what they're getting at, I think. Um, th they have a figure here, which is this figure just shows like the genetic algorithm, how it's laid out. There's this hardwired genome. There's what they call this competent genome, which is like uh, something that can reorganize. So this is a reorganization. So this is very heavy duty computational stuff. But I think that's what they're getting at is that they're evolving these uh, cells to generate like this, these embryos that can be malleable, basically. And then, you know, eventually what you're going to end up with is a system that can, um, you know, adapt. And you don't necessarily see this in the developmental uh, phase of any one embryo. This is all sort of that happens you know, in evolution. And then when you see the development of say one species versus another, they look different, they behave differently, but that's because they've gone through this process of evolution where the cells have like, you know, reconfigured, they've, they, they have this capacity for differential plasticity and all that. So it's, it's, it's kind of a hard thing to really explain, but uh, that's what I think is going on here. No, oh, it's very cool. So that's, I think yeah, that, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think that's it for today. I know we're kind of at the, the time limit. And uh, yeah, so that's great. We had that one paper on the, the GoPro camera stuff and the other paper on some very theoretical stuff, but I think, you know, uh, maybe food for thought, so. Yeah, just, just again, just want to say about Linda Smith, um, you know, that her, her book, um, with Fallon was was my first introduction to dynamic systems, dynamical systems in, in development. Okay, yeah, you know, yeah. But, uh, and um, and uh, you know, so much, um, so much uh, of, like prescient stuff was in in, there, in that. Um, and just like reading a review of it, um, you know, they acknowledge the antecedents in Gibson. Lakoff, Varela, Thompson, and Roche, you know, Dooney and Vygotsky. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you know, it's like 
Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's such all. a great, uh, such a great pedigree there, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so much like embodied cognition work. You know, again, like all back in the, you know, this is like early '90s. Yeah. Um, oh, there it is. And, uh, it's a book. Is that the book you mean? No, it's it's uh, dynamical systems. Oh. Um, sorry, uh, it's um, dynamic dynamic systems approach to the development of cognition and action. Yeah. So, oh, as okay. the, um, it, it, maybe it's. I don't know if that's the. Uh, I haven't seen this. Uh, I think that's it with Esther Thelen and. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. yeah. Sorry, the the, uh, the Amazon the the Amazon synopsis uh, was misleading. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, but cool. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great. Uh, I, I've you know, I've got it somewhere here in the library. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, all right. Have a good week. Uh, talk in the Slack or in our different side meetings, and uh, have a good, successful week. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.